Okay, so before I bring Paula out, I want to make sure everybody knows that you can buy her book. If you don't already have it, I have several copies. Um, we are here to hurt each other. It's upstairs for sale, and she'll be doing a book signing afterwards. And this book is um, really phenomenal because it is absolutely terrifying. Who has read the book? Okay, great. Uh, super terrifying and also really just incredibly written and beautiful to read. Um, and it has been a, uh, an Amazon bestseller um, and sitting right now at, at 20th on the um, African American horror bestseller list on Amazon, which is very exciting and set, spent quite a bit of time at number one on that list So um, after it was published. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Paula to come out here and do a reading. So Paula D. Ash is an author of dark fiction her debut collection, We Are Here to Hurt Each Other, was released in early 2022 by Nick Detating Books. She's a member of the Horror Writers Association and an associate editor for Vesterian, a literary journal. She lives in the Midwest, which is best with her family. So without further ado, here's Paula to introduce herself and uh, to do a quick reading. Right. Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. I super appreciate it. I know we had, um, you know, plans change because of the weather, uh, which is, you know, pretty on brand for Indiana. So that's uh, to be expected. Um, so I'm going to read a very, very short piece um, from We Are Here to Hurt Each Other, um, provided I can find it, because of course I didn't mark it down or anything. Why would I do that? Um, here it is, okay. So I'm gonna read a really a brief piece uh, from We Are Here to Hurt Each Other. Um, and I know, and I, before I kind of get into that, I just wanna thank you all for being here. Um, I wanna thank the Allen County Public Library. I wanna thank Aja um, for, for bringing this all together. Um, and yeah, I just really appreciate it. So, all right, I'm going to read a very uh, short piece called The Witness. Um, and uh, yeah, and then we'll get into our Q&A. So, she stands at the edge of a pit filled with useless gray bodies, their limbs stiffly twisted like discarded dolls. Soon, they will be covered in soil and lime. Soon, this place will disappear. Her eyes are the color of gnarled nickels. Later, machines split open the sky and ejaculate fire, boiling the color from upturned eyes. A naked girl screams while sheets of her skin melt from her bones like tallow. The irony is not lost in the woman watching. Her skin has always been ash. Blood cools in shapeless pools. The reasons are barked out over loudspeakers, echo through alleyways littered with the limbless dead. Inside the stone houses, the innocent hide and shake and pray. She wears a wreath of fresh roses in her hair to subdue, subdue the stench of the dying. Their screams, however, she likes. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I know, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little heavy, but you know, um, that's the point, right? Yes, that's, that's, that's what I do. So um, thank you so much for being here. So Absolutely. glad that you're joining us. I have to, um, in full disclosure, tell you that Paula and I are friends. Um, we've known each other for ever, a million years. At um, least 14, yeah. at least. I've, I've, I've lived in Fort Wayne for about 14 years, so. Um, been in each other's weddings and, mm -hmm. um, and therefore, so, our children, our respective children's births. Yes. Um, yep. So, yeah. so um, I, I'm slightly biased when I, <laughs> when I when I sing her praises, um, but I really do believe that this book is and your work generally is so incredible, and I'm just so proud of the success that you've had with it. Thank you. Um, Thank and you just so lucky to know you. So, um, I'm going to ask some questions that I have prepared, and we'll let Paula respond, and then we'll take questions from the audience. And also we have folks joining virtually and they may ask questions as well in the YouTube um, live stream. So we may take those as well. You ready? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> okay, so I have always found you to be a kind, giving, easygoing person. You are so chill. <laughs> I try, thank you. Um, you know, you're not weird. You're not, you're not violent. 
Oh, fair. Yeah. You're not particularly angry or no. uh, you're always just so warm. So when I read your work, it always kind of shocks me. Like I'm just always like, I just can't believe that this person that I know and I hang out with, like this is in her brain. <laughs> and um, so I wonder where you get your ideas. Yeah, that's a that's a that's that's always the question. Like that's always the question. People read my work um, and they're just like, how do you come up with this? Like, or, or alternately, the question is, who hurt you? Are you okay? <laughs> um, which is a fair question. Um, uh, so it comes from a lot of places. So, um, so one thing that I, that I have to say is I very intentionally write horror. Like, it's very much like what I do on, on purpose. Um, and one thing that horror does, and for my uh, Women's Studies 225 students, listen up. Um, <laughs> One thing that horror does is it, 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 the purpose that it serves, the function that it serves in popular culture, whether it's in movies or TV shows or in literature, um, is that it serves a safe place for us to express our anxieties. So whether our individual like anxieties as people, but then also like our collective anxieties. So like our anxieties as a society, our fear of the other, the idea that there is us and then there's them, right? So horror gives us a chance to work those things out. Um, and certainly I'm no you know, uh, exception to that. I have my own personal anxieties that I work out in my, in my fiction, but then I think also as somebody who pays a lot of attention to like societal issues and political issues, um, it's, horror is a way for me to work those things out too, to, to have some conversations and discussions about some of the, the, the ways that our society is developing and, and the places that it's been, um, where otherwise, you know, I just feel like trying to explore that in other genres just doesn't work as well for me. Um, to specifically answer your question though, uh, I, I don't know, I, I know that's not a great answer. I don't know, I think I just, I've always been, uh, my my mom is here, um, and here's my mom. Uh, my, <laughs> I, you know, I didn't have like a terrible childhood or anything. I didn't have like, um, you know, particular like anything like super traumatic happened to me. But I've always been intrigued by horror. I've always like ever. Me and you know Meg were were talking about earlier. You know, the first time I saw a Nightmare on Elm Street, I, I was five years old. My mom did not want me to watch it. I, begged and begged for her to let me watch it. And her, her, uh, our, our compromise was that we would watch it, but she would be able to put a blanket over my head for the scary parts. Now, if you've ever seen the first Nightmare on Elm Street, you're probably aware of the fact that the whole movie is one scary part. So I watched most of that movie just kind of like, like with my eyeball peeking out of the blanket. But from that point on, even though it scared me to death, I had so many, nightmares about Freddy Krueger, I, I wanted to watch it again, and I wanted to watch it again, and you know, the, the, the Nightmare on Elm Street is a, is a series, and um, <clears throat> so I had a lot of opportunity to watch a lot of it, um, and, but I just, like, it, it's, I don't know, like, it sunk, it's, it's hooks in me really young, and that's just, it's that's, claws. It's claws, thank, thank yeah. you, <laughs> like, we gotta be on brand with Freddy. Um, it sunk its claws into me, and that's, that was, that was just it. I've always been into it ever since I was very young, so. Yeah, I think it was the first one I watched too. It must yeah. have been that time. period. I think it was that time period for like early '80s. Like that was what was on, you know, like cable. I think at the time, and so that's that's what we all watched. Yeah, the one that got me though was The Exorcist. Ooh. That's the one that, like, I never got over. I did you watch <laughs> it as a kid? Like you were young? Youngish, like probably like nine or ten. Oh no! Yeah, that's, I didn't watch The Exorcist My mom until I hopefully was. Hopefully, doesn't see this. <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't think she knows I was that young. <laughs> You're gonna be in trouble. I I didn't see The Exorcist until I was well into adulthood, and I saw it in the theater. But my mom told me about The Exorcist in great detail when I was very young, and it just messed me up. Like I'm sorry, <laughs> um, but it just it messed me up so bad. So I saw it. I, I was terrified of that movie, and then I watched it as an adult, and I, I quite enjoy it. It's a it's a good film, but I can't imagine watching it. At I think some of it was work. lost on me. At sure. That age. Oh yeah. Because so, when I watched it as a teenager, I was like. Yeah, I don't yeah, remember like, well, all this. But, yeah, right. <laughs> um, I also read it very young, and mm -hmm. so um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, but all that aside, I don't read a lot of horror, mm -hmm. um, and if I didn't know you, I probably would not have ever come across this book. It's just um, not the type of 
it's, you know, not what I usually read. Sure. Um, but, you know, I'm spreading the gospel of this book, you know, to, to everybody. Like, you got to read this book. No, you, just, you don't understand. Um, and I always feel like I have to put these disclaimers on it. Mm-hmm. Like, it's rough, okay? It's, you know, it's, it's heavy. And Jeff's laughing because I had this conversation with him. Like, um, and I always, I have certain stories, depending on the person I'm talking to, that I suggest they start with. Mm-hmm. Because I don't think you should just necessarily start at the beginning. Sure. If you're not ready. And yeah. I mean, there are content warnings for a reason. So, yeah. And if you're at all concerned, don't start with bereft. Um, no. So, oh God. Um, yeah. but... I always kind of tell people that, but I also tell them it's beautiful and the writing is incredible. Um, but I am curious, so that, like I have like the gateway stories to hook people, mm-hmm. and I'm curious where you think a new horror reader should start in the book. So I tell people when it comes to my work, they're the, the safest, it's a really limited type of safe, it's not safe at all, um, <laughs> but your safest bet is the mother of all monsters um, because that is... It's a standalone um, story that you can get. Um, it's, it's obviously in the collection, but it's also, it's like a standalone on Kindle. So if you wanna like do a little sample before you know, diving into the collection, that's a safe bet. Um, it's also a safe bet because, I mean, it's, it's a pretty heavy story. Um, it's, it's one of my earlier works. Um, it deals with parent-child relationships, which is a, um, um, a theme I kind of revisit quite a, a lot. Um, it's set in the Midwest, it's set in Indiana, um, but it's, a, it's more like a kind of a true crime. It's obviously it's fiction, but it's more like a true crime kind of story. It has that mm-hmm. true crime flavor. And so I think that's kind of what makes it a good introductory to the rest of the work because a lot of people are familiar with true crime. You know, we, we, the true crime is blown up in our culture. Um, we, we love police procedurals like Law and Order and all those kinds of, you know, SVU and all those sorts of things. So it's very similar in, in tone to that. Um, so I think that's a good way to like kind of get people into it. And then if they find that, okay, I can deal with this, I can work with this, then you can go into the more darker, deeper stuff. Um, save bereft for last though, and maybe like have somebody you can talk to afterwards because mm-hmm. that story is not a joke. So yeah. <laughs> just, uh, just now it's gonna you. have like be the one that everybody that, 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 opens everybody up everybody to first. Yeah, and then <laughs> they're gonna be like, oh yeah. my god, like, you guys, <laughs> I'm not kidding. So <laughs> um, so I'm glad you brought up Mother of All Monsters yes. because that I think was the first of your works I ever read. Mm-hmm, and probably, yeah. it does have like a true crime like serial killer. I'm really yeah. intrigued by serial killers mm-hmm. and so it's like a serial killer. It is a serial killer yeah. vibe and um, yeah. And it refers to like Midwest locations, like it mentions the Salamone Reservoir. Mm-hmm. And so we assume from the story that the, it's happening near Fort Wayne-ish. Yeah, um, yeah. And mm-hmm. what is it about the Midwest that really lends itself to be a backdrop across several of your stories? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so, I mean, part of it is obviously like ease of like access. Like I, I live here, I lived in the Midwest my whole life. Um, I lived. Uh, I'm originally from Dayton, Ohio, and, and then I moved here about 14, 15 years ago. Um, and so it's because it's what I know, right? Like, it's, it's, it's familiar, it's what I know. Um, because we had kind of talked about the questions that we were going to discuss today, one of the things that I, um, I was curious about, I was, because I, I don't know if other people joke about this, but I always jokingly say that, like, you know, Midwest, the, the Midwest and Indiana in particular has two of too many things. We have too much corn, <laughs> and we have too many serial killers. Um, But what I learned yesterday is that we're not even in the top 20, which I'm not saying that we should advocate for that. I'm not. (laughs) It's not a goal. It's not a goal to to aspire to. Like, let's lower the number, if anything. Um, This is recorded and people are going to hear it. Um, I'm getting in trouble. But no, um, but Indiana and Ohio both seem to have a preponderance of serial killers. And so I think that's part of it. Um, in addition to serial killers, you know, people like Jim Jones are originally, you know, from here. The People Simple was in Gary, Indiana. Um, there's just a lot of weird stuff that happens in the Midwest. And I think it's a lot, because I think a lot of it is because of the environment itself. So we're in kind of a rust belt area where there's, 
you know, what used to be a really bustling kind of industry, but has fallen into ruin. So there's a lot of abandoned factories, and that kind of leads to, that can lead to like poverty and urban decay and things like that, um, which can contribute to crime. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think that that lends itself as well. Like there's just a lot of places where people can do shady things. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think, you know, a lot of people are talking now about like Midwest nice. So the way that people in the Midwest are, you know, kind of superficially nice, mm -hmm. but then there's a darkness to that. And I think that all just kind of contributes to, to like uh, a really rich vibe for, for writing horror, at least in, in my experience, that's, that's what it's about. Yeah, and almost there's like this veil of safety to like yes. the Midwest, yes. I think, is what I'm always sort of like. Yeah. When you yeah. hear about something happening here, you're like, oh, we thought it was safe. We thought here. it was safe, and, I, and that's, a, that's a big thing I, I, I talk about a lot in my work is how, you know, like safety, um, you know, safety is an illusion. Like anything can happen at any time, and so I think, you're, I think you get hit the nail on the head. Like, you know, the Midwest is supposed to be homey and cozy, and everybody's, you know, nice and kind, and that's, that's well, True-ish, whatever. Um, <laughs> excuse me, but for the but the the idea that the Midwest is supposed to be safe, but it's you know obviously not. I think that that also really makes for um, um, a, a really fertile space to to tell like really dark stories. So, so um, I don't know if you've read reviews for We Are Here to Hurt Each Other lately, but um, you if you want like a you want to feel good about yourself, go and read some of those reviews, okay? Because I read them just to kind of prepare, and people said just really amazing things. Um, but what really struck me was how they all caught the same thing I caught, which is that the writing is disarming because the writing is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. the, the, the prose is just, it just flows so, it's so lovely that you forget what you're reading um, and you kind of get lost in it. Um, someone said that the that the way that you write gives the seriously grisly stuff a sort of romance. Hmm. And I wonder if you agree that your voice and the quality of the writing is something that maybe isn't so common in horror, and if there are other, other authors, horror authors, that have kind of a similar voice. Yeah, um, that's a good question, and thank you to whoever wrote that. That's really nice. Um, uh, so as far as the 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 quality of the writing. Um, so we, we were talking about this earlier, a little bit earlier before we um, started the uh, event, but so one of my favorite writers is Toni Morrison. And Toni Morrison is an incredible writer. Um, the lyricism, the poetry, the, the harrowing nature of her, of her work, it's very disarming um, in that same kind of vein. And so I think I was just very heavily influenced by, by her work. Um, and the, her work was very instrumental in kind of showing me that you can describe really ugly things in a beautiful way, and that's very, like it gets people's attention. Um, but you can also do the reverse. You can describe something very beautiful in an ugly way, and that's also disarming to, to the reader. And I find that dynamic really interesting. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I, I appreciate that people um, see that. As far as if other horror writers do it, I think it's hit or miss. Like, I certainly don't think that, that I write better than any other horror writers. I think a lot of it is what's your comfort level in telling a story, and then also what's your ability in terms of telling a story. Um, I, I think that some people just like a straightforward, you know, just a no frills, you know, no uh, kind of like a meat and potatoes kind of story. Um, and other people want, you know, a, a seven course meal. They want to they want a feast. And I'm, I'm for the feast people. Um, uh, I like it rich. I like it decadent. Um, that's just what I'm, I'm into. As far as other writers in a similar vein, the, the, the name that always comes, well, there are several who come to mind. Um, I, I'm very influenced by Clive Barker. I know we're going to talk about that in a bit. Um, Clive Barker is a master of that. Um, Elizabeth Massey is, a, is another writer who writes in a very lyrical fashion, but it's some of the most heinous stuff you could you could ever read. Um, and then, as for more uh, contemporary, like kind of up and coming writers, Eric LaRocca, who uh, wrote the novella um, "Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke." Uh, which was really popular on like TikTok last year, and, and he is just like blowing up, and, and he's a fantastic writer. Um, 
he also writes in a very lyrical and beautiful way, but it's very disarming and it's very, um, it, it really gets into your brain and gets under your skin and you don't really realize it until the end. Um, and I, I think, you know, it just depends on kind of, the thing about horror, particularly now, there's so much out there. So if you want, you know, like, <laughs> excuse me, this sounds bad, but if you want like the horror equivalent of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, that is available. <laughs> if you want the horror equivalent of, you know, like a seven course meal, that is also available. So it just depends kind of on, on what you on what you like and what your tastes are, so. Okay. So you said a little bit about, um, you know, people who, they have the ideas, but maybe not the, the ability to turn those ideas into as, what is literature, what is art. You sure, know? yeah. Um, so what advice would you give to a budding author, a new author, who they have these stories in their head, but maybe mm -hmm. they're thinking like, this is too out there, it's too wild, it's too scary, nobody wants to read this. Mm -hmm. Everybody um, wants to read it. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your advice to, to get them to actually put that down on paper? <laughs> Um, so seriously, there is nothing too weird or wild to write down. Mm -hmm. um, I can assure you, there are uh, genres and subgenres that, you know, the weirder, the wilder, the better. Um, there's always somebody out there who who wants to read your work. Um, I, I think for a really long time, personally, because my work is so dark and and I think kind of confrontational in a lot of ways, um, I didn't always take every opportunity that was presented because I always was was nervous, like, oh, this is too much, this is too, you know, it's too subversive, it's too transgressive. Um, but I, I, I think, uh, you know, things happen as they, as they should, but I also, um, I think that there are more opportunities that I could have taken, but I held myself back because I, I was waiting for permission. And so I think the one thing I would say to, to budding authors or you know budding creators in any kind of you know um, genre or medium is you know don't wait for permission like just like like do it because that's how you know that's how we have breakthroughs that's how that's where we get innovation from that's that's what keeps the genre fresh and, and moving um, it's scary for sure but excuse me it's scary for sure but it's it's I think it's worth it and like I said I mean there are, I, I, there are stories out there that are just some of the most bizarre and weird, you know, stuff that, that you can imagine. Um, there was, I was, I was reading a, a story the other day, it was, a, it was a horror romance about a lady and a pencil, and I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> yep. Uh, and so there's an audience for, for there's everything. There's an audience for everything. Okay. That's what I'm saying. There is, an, there is literally an audience for everything. Um, there's nothing under the sun that people don't want to read. And it's, and it's surprising, but, but it's, you know, it's absolutely true. So. I want to talk a little bit about your process. Okay. So um, your mom, your wife, you have a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you find time to write? And I'm curious, is it a thing that you're kind of always doing? Or is it a thing that like you assign time and you sit down and you write? Um, so usually when somebody asks, where, how do you find time to write? I usually say, I don't, <laughs> which is not funny. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a mixture of both. So I'm, I'm kind of always writing in my head, particularly at night once everybody's asleep and I'm up kind of doing chores. Like I'm, I'm kind of writing in my head. And then on weekends, I try to uh, schedule like two to three hours of a long time where I can just kind of write um, and get the stuff out that I've been working on throughout the week. Um, now that sounds very consistent and um, productive. It doesn't always work out like that. Um, I wish it did, but maybe the more I, I do it, it'll, it'll get better. Um, but yeah, so a lot of it is just trying to, what I found has been really helpful is divorcing the idea of preciousness from writing. So. I don't know how many you know people in here also write, but there's this idea, this image of the writer, you know, alone at a desk. Maybe they have candles lit, they have the music <laughs> going, they have uh, you know their a, a bottle of wine or a glass of wine, or maybe they have a bottle. I don't know. Um, there's wine. They use uh, a quill. <laughs> they write, they use a quill. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, it's, it's this very elaborate kind of scene. I, I don't have time for that. Um, I hope that is not how my life works. So what I do quite often a lot of my the stuff that's in 
we are here to hurt each other was actually written on my phone um, because I just I don't have I, I don't have the time to to sit down and you know open my laptop. I can do that you know when I have the time for it, but I don't often have the time for that. So I had to just get to okay, what's the most like practical way I can tell this story? I can write the story down. I'm just going to write it down on my phone while I you know wash dishes basically. Um, and so divorcing myself of the idea of like the preciousness and the ritual, which I know for some people is really like important. If you have the space to do that, that's that's fine. But like my life don't my wife my life don't work like that. So <laughs> I just gotta write when I can. Well we want you to keep writing. So thank you. <laughs> find the time. Um, okay, so I want to congratulate you. Thank you. Because you have made it onto the preliminary ballot mm -hmm. for a Bram Stoker Award. Yes. Um, which I'm not a horror reader, but that deserves some applause. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Um, tell us about what a big deal it is and what it means to, to be on that preliminary ballot. Sure, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Thank you all for clapping. Um, I, I appreciate that Asha was like, no, it's a big deal. You're going to clap. Um, cause that's, that's the kind of friend you need when you, when you create, you need somebody <laughs> like Aja. Um, so it's a big deal. So it's, it's, uh, the Bram Stoker award is given out, um, every year by the Horror Writers Association. Um, it's an international organization. It's, um, um, kind of headquartered in the United States. Um, and they give out, it's basically like the premier award for horror writing. Um, some past award winners, they have various awards like Lifetime Achievement Awards, uh, Superior Achievement in a First Novel, Superior Achievement in a Debut Collection, things like that. Um, some previous winners were people like Stephen King, um, Clive Barker, uh, the Duffer Brothers who create Stranger Things. Um, like you said, the guy from Mike Flanagan for Midnight Mass mm -hmm. was recently on the preliminary ballot as well. Um, so it's a, it's a big deal. I mean, this is a, uh, an award that, um, or a series of awards that has a great deal of heft in the in the community um, and and beyond. Um, a lot of people once they get that nomination. So I'm on the preliminary ballot, which is not the same as a nomination. The nominations are announced at the end of this month, I believe. Um, and then the actual award ceremony is at StokerCon, which is in June. So it's a convention, a uh, horror writers convention for people who are in the Horror Writers Association. Um, and so there's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big deal. If, you, if you're nominated officially, like you can put that on your book um, you can put it in your bio and all that stuff, and you are a, officially a Stoker-nominated writer. Um, if you win the award, that's an even bigger deal. Um, so yeah, it's, it was it was really surprising to to uh, receive that that information. I was I was pretty, um, yeah. I mean, all puns aside, I was stoked. Um, <laughs> Uh, but no, it was it was a pretty big deal. I was really surprised that you know my my book was was recognized in that way, and it's 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 had such a this book has had such an incredible journey from from where you know it started to where it's going. So yeah, it's just it, it feels really good. Yeah, you're so big time. <laughs> so okay, <laughs> so I want folks to know you've got new material coming out, and yes. so. Um, I know that you are in an upcoming anthology about bugs. Yes. <laughs> I know this because another uh, 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 common friend that we have is also in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, her name is Jacqueline Garver, mm -hmm. and she's in incredibly talented she's as so well. Hard. Yes, um, she's amazing. And so you both are going to be in here, which mm -hmm. makes me feel like kind of the coolest kid in school because <laughs> my friends are so talented, I can't write anything. Um, so tell us about this anthology and what we can expect from it, from your story. Yeah, so the, um, the, the collection, the anthology is um, called... Um, uh, Oh God, we, I can, I always mess it up, I'm so sorry. It's called, um, uh, I think it's, it's something like, oh, the, this world belongs to us. Uh, and it's an anthology about bugs. Um, and, uh, okay, I'll be real with y'all. My story, is, I'm still in the process of working on it. It's probably the grossest thing I've ever written. Like I'm not, and when I say that, please know, when I say gross, I mean gross, like it's real bad. Um, so the reason why my story is so gross is because I 
am not a fan of bugs. <laughs> and I know that sounds terrible. I know you're not supposed to kill spiders and all that stuff, which, okay, whatever, that's fine. But um, certain types of insects just really creep me out. Like, on like a, like a primal level, like, like that thing has too many legs. I don't like it. Um, I so the same way about birds. <laughs> right, yes, I, yes, yes, your, 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 um, your fear of, of, of birds is, um, so intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you wanted to say funny, but <laughs> no, I know. What? No, I would never think it's kind of funny. Um, no. Um, bugs scare you. They, they, yes, I don't like, um, I, I'm particularly uh, averse to like earwigs and centipedes. I don't, they bother me so much. But anyway, so um, so that's, so my story is dealing with, it, it's uh, speaking of like working through anxieties, it's my anxieties about um, those types of insects, but also uh, it's a story that's about grief. It's about the the, the way that grief transforms um, people um, and and kind of puts them in, you know, a really, I mean, unstable. Like grief can put you in a really unstable state of mind. And um, how, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know what what lengths people will go through or what links people will go, uh, will, will go to to try and absolve themselves of guilt, particularly when that guilt is, is connected and associated with some kind of grief. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's what that particular story in that collection is about. And I believe, I think that'll be out in May, I want to say. I think, I think, I think May is when that'll, that'll be coming out, so. Yeah, I'm excited to read it. Yeah. Okay, my last question before we go to the audience is, what scares you? Besides bugs. Um, yeah. Like, what do you find particularly terrifying? I mean, it's the stuff of, like, like, it's the stuff of, like, human life, you know? Like, you know, a, the death of a loved one, um, uh, you know, natural disasters, uh, war, those, like, it's very human stuff that I'm, like, I'm not scared of, like, like ghosts or supernatural things because that stuff it just doesn't seem real to me so it doesn't scare me but the stuff that scares me honestly people people scare me like that's <laughs> yeah. the thing that 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 scares me because i'm a i'm a in many ways like a student of like human beings and human you know psychology and sociology and things like that and i i think the thing that's most disturbing to me is just people and what people are capable of i think a lot of my fiction is about um that I mean, I, I mentioned kind of earlier. Aja and I both mentioned the story bereft, which is, you know, hands down one of the most horrifying things that I have ever written, if not the most horrifying thing I've ever written. The thing about bereft, though, it's based on a true story. Um, the stuff that happens in that story is not, um, you know, verbatim what happened in real life, but it was based on a real, you know, a real instance where um, I won't go into too much detail, but it's a story about. Um, the imprisonment, uh, a man imprisons his, his daughters. Um, and that happens in real life. Like that's a terrifying, horrible thing that happens in real life. And so um, I think the basis of that is like what scares me is like that people are capable of so much, you know, like um, horrifying behaviors and horrifying things to other people. And it's a lot of where the, the title for the book comes from. So that's what scares me. Okay. Thanks. Any questions, folks? <laughs> thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you all for coming, for sure. I appreciate Anybody it. Anybody on any questions, Rachel, from the interweb? The internet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Can I you step up to the mic if you're comfortable with that? Yep. <coughs> okay. Well, I have a comment and a couple of questions, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so. I, I attended a lecture that you gave on the movie Martyrs a few years ago. Yeah. And it was, it's just so nice to be able to hear you talk about your work now <laughs> in light of that. Uh, but I have a couple of silly questions from uh, things I've seen on Twitter. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. So, um, first off, speaking of movies, I noticed that you were pretty hype about the new Hellraiser movie. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion of that? So, okay, so y'all like, can see like my Hellraiser stuff up here. Um, I'm a big Hellraiser fan. Um, and so last year, Hulu had a new Hellraiser movie, like a adaptation, remake, kind of reimagining of Hellraiser. 
Um, I loved it. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Um, you know, it, <clears throat> excuse me. A lot of people, you know, people have opinions about remakes and reboots, and I and I get it. Like I'm, like I would much prefer something original, but I think they took this remake or reboot or whatever you want to call it um, in, a, in a new enough direction that it made it both true to the original, uh, particularly true to the novella it's based on, but also went into some different directions that I thought was really, really interesting. And I really love uh, Jamie Clayton's performance as the priestess. She was absolutely incredible. So, yeah. yeah. Agreed. For yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, and my other question, uh, because I'm a big fan of that account, how did it feel to be featured in the Midnight Pals uh, Twitter account? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for, for asking about that. Um, that. That was so like, like I am next level. Like I'm on the Midnight Pals Twitter, like okay. Um, so for those of you who don't know, because you know. Uh, so how do I explain Midnight Pals? Um, it's like if... Uh, are you afraid of the dark featured horror authors? Yeah. yeah. And so the, the conceit is that it's Clive Barker, um, Edgar Allan Poe, Stephen King, and Dean Coots uh, sitting around a fire telling each other stories, but then other horror authors throughout time and space come in. Um, and Mary Shelley is like the quintessential badass, and she comes in because, you know, she created the, the genre, and so she comes in. Um, usually with a switchblade um, <laughs> and threatens people. And so uh, it's, this is on Twitter. And um, twice now, one time it was just mentioned, and then there was a, a full feature where the, the writer of um, uh, Midnight Pals, uh, Bitter Corella, did a whole thing about we are here to hurt each other. And it's, it's so funny. But it was also so like meaningful because you could tell that, um, that she really, like, like she really read the book and she really like like knew what was going on. So that was that was it was incredible. Like I have to say, I mean some of the other people featured are like like I said, Clive Barker, Stephen King, um, Stephen Graham Jones, uh, um, you know, Paul Tremblay, um, Haley Piper, Eric LaRocca, all these kinds of like classic and contemporary horror writers have been featured. So for for me to, you know, little old me to be featured was just such a such a big deal for me, so yeah, that's cool. Thank you for asking. Awesome, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else have questions? Okay, well, I want to thank you again for coming. We got, we got one here. Oh, there's a oh, question. another question. I think that's my boss. I, uh, I was wondering if you just, uh, like, instead of, say, stopping to, like, jot notes on your phone, do you ever uh, just record like um, ideas uh, with your with your uh, recorder? I so yes, that's a that's a great suggestion. I do voice recordings, um, particularly if I have like a long drive ahead of me. Like I'll do like voice recordings on my phone. Um, the problem with that, some like it works sometimes, but then sometimes like. Like sometimes it's just me rambling, and I'm like, what? What, what am I recording this for? <laughs> like, the, there's no story here. Like, I'm just talking. Um, for some reason, if I if I usually if I jot out notes on my phone, like it's something substantial I can go back to, and I know what I meant. Unless, of course, it's one of those things where I wake up like out of a dead sleep, and then I wrote down like pancake napkins, and I'm like. <laughs> What does this mean? So that does not help me at all. But the but the voice recording thing like that does work. That works. That works sometimes um, for sure. Like it's it's a nice way for me to kind of process, particularly if I'm stuck on a story. Because I think if you're ever stuck with any kind of writing, the the often the solution is to talk to somebody about it, to talk them through it. Um, so that it helps in that regard sometimes for sure. So yeah, it's a good question. Okay, I will apologize because I don't know your work, but <laughs> of your stories, if you were offered to make a major motion picture, which story would you feature? That's a good question. And if anybody would like to, no. Um, <laughs> um, and also, thank you, Rhonda. That's, that's my boss. That's Ms. Rhonda Merriweather, uh, director of the uh, Multicultural Center at PFW. Um, so, 
could probably tell us signatures from a future corpse, which is the last story in the book. It's a, nove it's a uh, no novelette, novella, um, kind of true crimey, uh, kind so of. So good. Thank you. It is a movie. Like, <laughs> when you read it. I, a lot of people have said that. Um, it's It's got a really fast pace to it. It's very action packed. Um, it's a story of a, it's a true crime kind of police procedural. Uh, there's a detective, two detectives who are investigating. Um, I almost started going into vicious felonies, but like, the, what? Uh, two detectives who are investigating a series of um, um, brutal uh, murders in a relatively small town in New England. Um, but there's some weird stuff happening alongside of it, and it's kind of this combination of, um, it's very much influenced by, I don't know if anybody watched True Detective season one, it's, it's very yeah. much influenced by, like influenced to the extent where I should like probably send that guy some money. <laughs> um, because, because I love True Detectives, Detective season one so much, um, and I also read a lot of Thomas Ligotti who influenced the, the, the guy who wrote True Detective season one, so. Um, but yeah, probably that, that novella I think would make a pretty decent adaptation um, because it was influenced by something so visual. I want to get the title right on it. Yeah. It's um, Tell Us Signatures from mm -hmm. a Future Corpse, right? Yes, that is, the, that is the title. If you're listening, Netflix, Hulu. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a follow-up to that question. So again, in your wildest dreams, who would star in that? Okay, so I actually... <laughs> have somebody asked me that question in an interview. And so I had like, I had had a lot of the uh, cast picked out already. So the main, the, the main character, the narrator of the story is a detective named LaSalle Loudon. And I'll just say right now, LaSalle Loudon is basically me. Um, now I don't often do that in my fiction. I don't self insert a lot. Like you know how, just as an example, Stephen King does a lot of self insertion. Like you know the characters like, a writer, a writer who's yeah. all, you know, like, okay, we get it, Steve, um, <laughs> which is fine. Uh, I, I don't do that very often. That's probably because of the nature of my work. Um, I don't want to be in it. Um, but with that story in particular, that the, the character of LaSalle Loudon is basically me. Um, so there is a stand-up comic by the name of Sam J, uh, who is um, a queer black woman. She has a show that comes on I want to say like HBO Max. Um, I don't know if it's still on or not, but she is exactly who I pictured when I pictured LaSalle Loudon, like she is that person. Um, and then the other uh, characters, um, Sean Simmons, who is her partner, um, the guy in, oh God, he, he's, the, he's an actor who was in uh, the movie Whiplash, the, I can never remember. J.K. Simmons. He was the dad in Juno. In Juno, yeah, J.K. Simmons. Yes, he was the dad in Juno. He would play uh, her her partner. And then, as far as like the other characters, I, I'm not I'm not really sure. Um, maybe Lauren Ambrose would be LaSalle's wife, because um, uh, I just think that I I don't know if anybody watches the show Servant. She's in that show, and she's a nut um, in a good way. Uh, so I think that's, but like them, those three characters are the ones who I, who I would sort of cast with um, <clears throat> more kind of like, I don't know, like not super well-known people, but well-known enough. So yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> other questions? Any other questions? Okay, well, uh, we have, we're gonna have some refreshments and um, the book sale happening upstairs and Paula will be up there to sign your copies. So, you know, if you want that, uh, you know, if we all have that like first edition of Carrie signed by Stephen <laughs> right. King, you know, like this is, it's on that level to me. So I do actually have a question from YouTube. Um, oh, okay. Shannon Barber asked, what is your favorite short story? Oh, oh man, Shannon, come on. Um, just the one? Okay, I'm gonna say Stephen by Elizabeth Massey is my favorite short story. Um, it is a story that, it's, you remember I talked earlier about like stuff that gives you permission. Stephen is the story that gave me permission to write the stuff that I write, to write as, as dark and as, you know, kind of uncompromising and, 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 com and confrontational as I write. Stephen was the story that gave me permission to do that, so. Hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a, 
it is a doozy. Um, <laughs> but uh, but um, but yeah, I think that I think if I have to choose one favorite short story, I'm going to go with that one. So. Okay. Well, thanks so much, folks. We'll see you upstairs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Production facilities provided by Access Fort Wayne. Learn more under the Explore tab at acpl.info.